since Moodle no longer has the projected final grade functionality, hopefully we'll have that back in next semester. I will be this afternoon posting on Moodle a spreadsheet since you all have free um, Microsoft Office, right? You all taking advantage of that? Yes. You also have Google Docs, but I, I, it's, it's a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet. I made it in Excel um, or Office 2016, so I can't guarantee it's going to work in other offices, but it should. Historically, there were problems with Macs, though. But what you can do is just copy the entire web page that has your grade report on Moodle, paste it into the spreadsheet, and then it will tell you what your grade is if you don't take the final exam and what your grade you need on the final gram would, exam would be to raise it. So you have to keep in mind that until all other grades are entered, that's not exactly correct. You know, if like you don't do the last homework assignment, well, that would lower your grade a little bit or so on. So this afternoon, I'll make sure I get in the attendance bonuses um, and have all the homework that is due so far. There's one homework still that's due tonight, so that one I won't put in until Sunday. But I will try to have it as accurate as possible. And as soon as I have exam four in, I'll put them in there. Right now I'm I'm about what twelve percent through or something like that grading the exam. But I you know have nothing to do on Sunday because the Raiders already lost this weekend. And so I'll just work on that. So any questions about those things before I start reviewing again? Okay, then let's get to reviewing. So last class period, we reviewed chapters one through five. So I'll pick up with chapter six. Chapter six is when we first start talking about rotational motion. So we had uniform circular motion stuff going around at a constant rate. And then we learned about angular acceleration. So we had new variables for angular velocity, angular acceleration, and of course, angle. Make sure that you know the different units for angles. So if you have something that's in degrees, you can change it to radians and you know when you need which. And then we had kinematic equations, just like the kinematic equations we had before, except now you're using the rotational variables. So instead of x is equal to x initial plus v initial t plus one half a t squared, you have theta, the variable for angle, is equal to theta initial plus omega, the variable for angular velocity, initial t plus one half alpha, the variable for angular acceleration, t squared. Why did we introduce this here? So we could have that centripetal acceleration. By definition, well, what does the word centripetal mean? I guess that would have been redundant to say by definition, what does it mean? What does the word centripetal mean? toward the center. The centripetal acceleration is the acceleration necessary pointing toward the center for something to go in a circle. And so we had the equation that centripetal acceleration was v squared over r or omega squared times r. Those two are exactly equivalent because the relationship that v is equal to omega r and that's the acceleration that's necessary. Something's going to go in a circle. Now, we also have the centripetal acceleration. What, what is the centripetal acceleration? Or not acceleration, force. Wow, did I say acceleration both times or did I? Only once. Okay, we also have the centripetal force. What is the centripetal force? It's the net force toward the center. The centripetal force just comes, taking, comes from taking Newton's second law. The sum of the forces toward the center is equal to the mass of your object multiplied by the acceleration toward the center. And this here we call the centripetal force. So the centripetal force is not a force unto itself. It's not like the force normal or the force of gravity that's acting on an object. It's the sum of the forces in the direction toward the center of rotation. So we can determine the relationship between the sum of those forces and the acceleration necessary to go in a circle. So make sure that you can do problems with rotational motion. We have the universal law of gravitation. 
which Newton determined force of gravity is proportional to the product of masses divided by separation squared. I think I talked about that last class period. We did not talk about satellite motion, so that's not potentially on the test. Chapter seven, work and energy. This is a whole new way to solve problems. So on exam two, you had a lot of problems that you could have solved either. <laughs> you had a lot of problems that you could have solved either by using Newton's second law, and we call that method dynamics. Well, Newtonian dynamics, or we could have solved it using work energy relation. And so on the test, like I looked at a problem and I said, ooh, I'm going to solve this this way. And then when I was grading exams, people solved them the other way. No problem, right? As long as it doesn't say use this method, you can use either method because they're equivalent. They're just using different principles. So energy is the ability to do work. Doing work is basically pushing on something and it moving. If you push on something and it moves the direction you're pushing, then that's a positive work. If you push on something and it moves the opposite direction you're moves out the direction you're pushing, then you did a negative work. What about if you push on something and it moves perpendicular to the direction you're pushing? It's zero work. Because we had that relationship, that work is equal to the force vector dotted with delta x vector. And the dot product means it's the parallel components. So energy, you have the ability to do work. You can have the ability to do work because of motion. So if a, a ball is flying toward you, it could hit you and make you move because it's moving already. So that would be kinetic energy. And we have the equation for that kinetic energy is one half mv squared for what we now call translational kinetic energy. We also have rotational kinetic energy. If something's rotating, like you know, you have the tire on your bicycle, you lift up the back wheel, you spin that tire, you don't just want to stick your finger in there between the spokes, right? Because it has energy and it will do work on your finger. So that's the rotational energy, one half I omega squared. New variables, I. I, the moment of inertia, it's the rotational equivalent to mass. Unlike mass, though, the value for the moment of inertia depends on where the mass is distributed. So if you have all the mass close to the center of rotation, it'll have a small moment of inertia. If it's far from the center of rotation, a large moment of inertia. Then for potential energy, potential energy is the ability to do work because of configuration or location. So the most prominent of those is gravitational potential energy. If I have my pin up here, if I let go, the force of gravity will do work on it. So it's a force that did the work. And to define a potential energy, we have to have what we call a conservative force, a force that if I do work on it, it will just return all of that energy. It'll do the work back for me. Switching up sides of the classroom, Manuel, you know, a little confusing. <laughs> okay. Um, other ones we had were the elastic potential energy. That's what a spring has. Um, electromagnetic, we didn't talk about that. We'll talk about that at the beginning of next semester. Chemical, we definitely won't talk about that. We leave that to the chemistry classes. Nuclear, we will talk about that. I mean, you can't have a nuclear power plant or a nuclear bomb without Einstein's famous equation that says e equals mc squared, which actually says that mass is just a form of energy. So something with more mass has more energy. And the way nuclear power works is you have a nucleus that's in an excited state. If you can reconfigure it to a lower energy state, it will give off energy. And so that's what we're doing in a nuclear bomb we have a bunch of uranium-235 atoms, for instance, that will give off a lot of energy if you break them into smaller pieces. And then we have neutrons break them into smaller pieces, give off all that energy. The total mass of the constituents after the explosion is less than the total mass before. And the difference in mass gives us the energy of the, that was released. Of course, bombs, I consider those bad. <laughs> 
nuclear power I consider good. So there's both good and bad there. It's a, a certain amount of responsibility scientists have to have. And when we talk about that, we'll go into you know, some ethics issues in physics. Um, thermal energy. Well, when we talked about heat and internal energy and all of our thermodynamics, then we were dealing with that internal energy, which had vibrational energy, molecules going like this. Acoustic energy is sound energy. As I'm speaking, I'm sending sound waves out of my mouth. And as I said, when we talked about sound, that's energy that's being transmitted to you. And so there's energy in that acoustic wave. Seismic waves are really the same thing as acoustic waves, but they're waves going through the ground and carrying energy, which is pretty clear. You know, you have an earthquake and a building falls down. There had to be some energy involved to make the building fall down. Work energy relation is the key to solving these problems. Work energy relation, work non-conservative, is equal to change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy. Now we learned from the first law of thermodynamics that energy can't be created or destroyed, but we can move it from mechanical energy into non-mechanical energy. And that's what this work non-conservative is doing. Something like friction that converts kinetic energy into thermal energy, right? You take your hands, you rub them together, they get warm because of that non-conservative work that was converting the kinetic energy of the moving hands against each other into thermal energy, heating up the molecules. Um, finally, the work done by variable forces, remember we could make a graph, and if we put force on this axis, and position on this axis, then if I want to know how much work is required to go from point A to point B, I can just simply take the area under the curve and that tells me how much work was required to go on that path. Chapter eight, linear momentum. Linear momentum means traveling in a straight path. Now, if you're driving your car and you go around a corner, you actually, I mean, you still have linear momentum, but the direction of it changed. We did our problems exclusively in one dimension. So we kept things in a straight line. And we learned momentum is defined as, it's a vector, mass times velocity vector. And Newton's second law is most correctly written as the sum of the forces is equal to, okay, I said most correctly, so I'll write it most correctly. It's most correctly written as a derivative, the derivative of momentum, of momentum with respect to time. Or for non-calculus, we approximate that to change in momentum over change in time. So that's the correct form of Newton's second law. So momentum will be conserved if the net force on an object is zero. So it's not a rule that momentum is conserved. It's a rule that If force net multiplied by delta t equals zero. Just taking that Newton's second law and solving it for changing momentum. So then we have momentum problems, things like, you know, I have a bowling ball, or let's, let's say smaller. A billiard ball rolls and hits another billiard ball of equal mass, and in that collision, the external forces are zero. If the external forces are zero, then momentum's conserved. But just having momentum conserved is not going to be enough to solve a problem, typically. You also have to know something else. So we had two types of collisions. We had elastic collisions where kinetic energy was conserved. And completely inelastic where they stick together and kinetic energy is not conserved. So we had to solve problems differently depending on if they stuck together in completely inelastic or if they bounced off each other completely elastically. Now there is a middle ground. You can have collisions that are not completely elastic or completely inelastic, but if you have that kind of collision, you're gonna have some clear specification on that. 
right? If it just says they bounce off of each other, assume that it is completely elastic unless there's other information like, you know, the kinetic energy afterward or the speed afterward is this, you know, something that would override the assumption of it being completely elastic. Okay, we did not do two-dimensional collisions and we did very little on the rocket propulsion, so I'm not gonna ask a question on that. Statics and torque. So statics, stationary things. We learned about torque being a rotational equivalent of a force. A torque is a force causing rotation. And we had torque equals R cross F. Our first, but certainly not gonna be our last, assuming you're here next semester, example of a cross product. Now I had a, a question on exam three that just had if I think it was C is equal to A cross B, then which had to be true. And I think the majority of people tried to add those. But a cross product is not addition. The second most common response was to try to multiply them. That also is incorrect. What is a cross product then if it's not addition and not multiplication? It's the multiplication of the perpendicular parts. It's the multiplication of the perpendicular parts. And so to calculate what the result is of a cross product, you have, really we do it two separate calculations. The magnitude is equal to A times B times the sine of the angle between the two. So if they're parallel, theta is zero and sine theta is zero. If they're parallel, the cross product is going to have a magnitude of zero. If that angle is 90 degrees or pi over two, if they're perpendicular, then sine of pi over two is one, and the magnitude is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B. And I should have put magnitude signs here. So that's how we find the magnitude. So the magnitude is somewhere between zero and the product of the two magnitudes. And it depends on the angle. And then for the direction, that's where we had to pull out the right hand rule. And so you have your right hand rule for direction. So it's the magnitude of C in direction given by right hand rule. And so with that right hand rule, you have the first item in the cross product is the index finger of your right hand. The second one is the middle finger. And then the direction of the answer is the direction of your thumb. So you should remember us, you know, me saying, pull out your right hand, got to use your right hand, and then pointing your fingers in directions. So as an example, if I hold this Okay, hold it at this angle. What direction is the torque created by this mouse about my shoulder? Okay, I see some correct answers. Make sure we all have it. I take my right hand, which is why I'm holding it my left, and point my index finger in the direction of the first item in the cross product. What's the first item in the cross product? Radius. So that's gonna point from the point I'm summing the torque about to where the force acts. So my index finger is pointing like that. And then I need to orient my hand so my middle finger can point the direction of the force. What direction is the force of this mouse? Down. So I have to be like that, like this, and my thumb points to my rear. So the direction of the torque is to the rear. So that was the principles that were involved with that problem that had the cross product. You had to apply both of those principles because the answers were not all down the same row. You had to consider both the magnitude and the direction. Okay, so we have the torque thing. It's important next semester when we talk about electricity and magnetism, we'll have a couple more right-hand rule variations. When we talk about making an electric motor, we calculate the torque created by the magnetic force, so we end up using two cross products in the one calculation to determine the torque of an electric motor. So it's something that is going to be coming back. Stability. 
if I have something that is in stable equilibrium, what is the stable part of stable equilibrium mean? This is another question we had in the last or exam three. Yeah. If something were to come and move it out of equilibrium, it would return back to its original place. Of right. Stable equilibrium, if it's displaced from equilibrium, it will come back. And so on the test question, you had to answer in terms of potential energy. If you're in stable equilibrium, what happens to the potential energy when you move away from equilibrium? It goes up. And things naturally try to go to the lowest available potential energy. And so that's why it comes back down. So that problem, you know, you had to have a graph that had potential energy as a function of position. And for stable equilibrium, you have to have a local minimum so it's locally stable. That is, the potential energy is a minimum at the equilibrium point. If I had asked for unstable equilibrium, up here would have been unstable. That's a funny way of writing U. And finally, if it had been neutral equilibrium, this region here would have been neutral. Now, what did we have? We had something that was, oh yes, the problem that I drew a picture for here. In this problem here, it asked how far can the person walk along the beam before it tips? The concept there was, well, before it tips, it's going to be in equilibrium. And when it's in equilibrium, you have, and so I know this is not on the same page, but it's where the picture is. In equilibrium, you have two fundamental equilibrium conditions. Some of the force vectors equal zero, and some of the torque vectors equal zero. And so I have to say, well, which one of these do I want to use? In that problem, you were given the mass of the beam and the fact that it's new, um, uniform, so you know the force gravity is acting at center. And you're given the mass of the person. So given the masses, you know the force of gravity is mg. So you can calculate those two forces. So you knew the values of those two forces. I don't know why I choose the colors I do. You knew the values of these two forces. You did not know the values of the other two forces. And you didn't know the position of the force of the person. So there were three unknowns. And so normally you'd say, well, three unknowns, I'm going to need three equations and I can solve it completely, right? But we can kind of take a shortcut on this problem. And there are a few people who recognize this. At the point where it's just going to tip, the left support is going to be supplying no upward force. If the person is back in a stable position, then both of the upward supports are going to be supporting it. But if they go too far, it's going to come off of the left one. So at the dividing point, the force of the left one is going to be zero. So that was using physics to determine. And so to solve that, you'd say at tipping point, force left equals zero. So now I only have two unknowns, the force of the right support and the position of the person. I could use Newton's second law to find the force of the right support, but I don't need to know that because when you use the sum of the torques, sum of the torques is about a location. And so I will just sum the torques at the point where the, the right pivot is, where the right post is. So I'm going to sum the torques about the right. And so then I'm going to have force of gravity times, and I'm just going to call it L1 for now, plus force of the person times L2. I have to pay attention to the signs. I put pluses on both. That can't be true. Which one of those makes a positive torque? Which one makes a negative torque? Force of the beam makes a positive torque. Okay. So the force of the beam, looking at this picture here, Going from my pivot point 
that direction, my right hand turns that direction, and my force gravity is down, so that comes out, and that's what we define as positive. So that was a positive torque. This one here, my force goes that direction. I need to orient my hands so my fingers are down. That goes in, so we define it as negative. So it should have been like this. Whoops, that's it. I was thinking ahead. There are two more forces that I didn't put because I would have force right times zero because its position is where I'm summing the torques and plus the force left, which is zero times, call it L3 for now, right? So these two were both zero. One, because I used my physics understanding to know at the tipping point, force left is zero. The other one, because I use my physics knowledge to say if I sum the torques about a force, it will have zero for its lever arm, makes no torque. And so then I'm left with the simple relationship that L2 is equal to L1 times In that case, it was, uh, what, 4.5 minus 3.9. Yeah, no, I don't remember what the numbers are, honestly. So I guess I can't put in numbers. But you just put in the, the value for L1, which would be that distance, and you can find L2. So that was an equilibrium problem that we solved there use the idea of sum of torques is zero in equilibrium, could have used the idea of sum of the forces zero in equilibrium, but I found a way to do it where I didn't have to. Sometimes you have to use both. So there's a lot of, of actual thinking of physics that goes on in those equilibrium problems. Simple machines, we did a lab on a simple machine. What's the purpose of a simple machine? It's something to allow you to do work while applying a lower force, right? The, in a perfect simple machine, the work you put in is equal to the work that comes out. But the force you put in is smaller than the force that comes out. But of course, something has to give. If the force you put in is smaller than the force out, what's the thing that gives? Yeah, the, the distance that you had to apply your force is much larger than the distance that you move the thing. And so with the simple machines, we talked about the mechanical advantage, which is the ratio of the force out to the force in, and how to calculate the theoretical mechanical advantage, the actual mechanical advantage, and so on. Chapter 10, back to rotation. When we previously talked about rotation, it was primarily so we could talk about circular motion and that centripetal acceleration idea. Now we come back to talk about the dynamics of rotational motion, talking about things like a tire rolling down the road. And we found that there is a rotational or angular momentum that has the symbol L, it's a vector, equals I omega. And we found there is a rotational equivalent to Newton's second law that says the sum of the torques is equal to I alpha or change in angular momentum over change in time. And so we were able to use this last one, the rotational equivalent of Newton's second law, to explain things like how it's easier to maintain your balance when you're on a rolling bicycle than when you're on a stationary bicycle. Because you have the angular momentum in the tires, when you start to lean, the tire actually turns, because of conservation of angular momentum as the tire turns, that's gonna actually have a correcting influence on you to try to keep you up. We also have things, like, here's something I didn't talk about. Tightrope walking. I've never done tightrope walking. I've not tried the slack rope walking, but I think that would be harder. But when I was in high school, I walked all over on top of our, uh, our cow pens. You know, you got the, we use like, two and a half inch pipe for our pens. And I'd walk on those in my boots. And usually I didn't lose my balance, but if I started to lose my balance, what do you suppose I did? I didn't fall, I didn't jump off, what did I do? I put my arms out, right? We all know if we start to fall, we put our arms out, right? Why do we do that? 
<clears throat> when you put your arms out, it changes your moment of inertia. What is it going to do to that moment of inertia? It's going to increase it. And since if you have the same torque, right, you've tipped over, you've lost your balance, your center mass is a little bit over to the side of your feet, so you have a little bit of torque. So that means you're going to start falling. And omega is your angular velocity, the rate at which you're falling. If you put your arms out and you increase I, the moment of inertia, you're going to decrease omega, the rate at which you're falling. And you're going to decrease alpha, the rate at which you're speeding up with that falling. And so by putting your arms out, you slow your fall, which gives you more time to correct your balance. And so if you are not a crazy tightrope walker, you know, like let's say you're walking over Niagara Falls. If you're a crazy tightrope walker, you know, you do a pushing a wheelbarrow. But if you're a wise one, you carry this big rod. Why carry this big rod that goes out like 20 feet on either side? It increases your moment of inertia. So if you start to fall, you've got all day to correct, you know, correct your balance and get there, which would be smart going over Niagara Falls because you have wind and whatnot. If a gust of wind hits you, you need to have some time to you know regain your balance and not just say, ah, well, I won't take a swim anyway. Okay, then we talked about the rotational kinetic energy that I mentioned before. And the work done by torque, completely analogous to the work done by a force. So by force, it was force dot delta x. For torque, it's torque dot delta theta. Now, you might say, why do you have a dot product between torque and delta theta? Well, because in real life, you can have rotation about three independent axes. And you can have torques about three independent axes. So, for instance, when I had somebody sit in the chair and spin the net torque about the vertical axis was zero, which meant the angular momentum about the vertical axis was conserved. So as they put, you know, hands out, they slowed down, brought them in, they sped up for conservation of momentum, angular momentum about the vertical axis. But there was no conservation of angular momentum about a horizontal axis. If the person leaned over to the right, they didn't just, you know, keep going because they had the chair supplying a counter torque that would keep them up unless they leaned too far. So, these are vectors. They still have directions for the rotations. Two slides. Okay, now we're getting into recent material. Fluids. Static fluids first, then dynamic fluids. Static fluids, stationary fluids. Fluids that aren't flowing. The molecules are not stationary, right? That was one of Einstein's papers in 1905 talked about why Brownian motion occurred. It was because of the motion of the molecules of water. So the first thing we did was talk about three common states of matter, matter, solid, liquid, and gas. There are others, right? We talked about things like the plasma. Next semester, we'll talk about electricity and it'll make more sense. And the things that differentiate a solid from a liquid from a gas, solids, the molecules have fixed positions. So they basically keep the same shape and size. They can be compressed a very small amount, but we usually consider them incompressible because it takes a very large stress for a very small strain. Liquids, the molecules are held together, but they can move about each other. So the molecules aren't fixed, the positions aren't fixed, so you can have changing shape, but they have a fixed volume because they're held together. And then the gas, the molecules are free of each other, they can bounce around, they'll fill whatever you put them in. Um, pressure units, this one here, what does PA stand for? Pascals. Pascals. Not, you know, the mamas and the papas or anything like that. PSI, pounds per square inch. ATM, atmospheres, tor, short for Torricelli, that's millimeters of mercury. Um, I saw somebody wisely using the distinction between absolute pressure and gauge pressure on exam four. Um, Absolute pressure, or no, it was exam three. It was exam three. It was the one with the air flowing over the, the house. Absolute pressure is, you know, just saying, well, molecules hit it. What's the average force per unit area produced by those molecules? That's the absolute pressure. Gauge pressure is comparing it to something, usually atmospheric pressure. So something with a gauge pressure, well, like the tires in my car. 
a gauge pressure of nominally 36 PSI. That means the pressure inside is 36 PSI higher than the pressure outside. Um, make sure you know Pascal's principle, Archimedes principle. Pascal's principle says that if I increase the pressure here, it increases everywhere in the fluid if it's a continuous fluid. Archimedes principle was the one about buoyancy. Um, you had the question about the duct floating. When the duct, well, Archimedes principle tells us that the buoyant force is equal to the weight of displaced fluid So that's always true. The buoyant force is equal to the weight of the displaced fluid. Now, if I have that ducky floating, there are some people who, it, it did say the, that it floats in the problem. Some people apparently didn't realize that. If it's floating, then I know floating, the net force is equal to zero. And so if the net force is equal to zero, then I have the downward force, the weight of the duck, the upward force, the buoyant force, adds up to zero means that I'm going to have the force buoyant is equal to the force of gravity of my ducky. But since the force buoyant is also equal to the weight displaced, then the beaker with the water in it and the floating duck weighs exactly the same as the beaker that was filled with water because the weight of the water displaced was exactly equal to the weight of the ducky that displaced it. The same idea tells us things like if in the, in the Arctic region, we have icebergs, right? The polar ice cap. And these icebergs are floating in water. Why do the icebergs float in the water? Ice is less dense than water, so the ice floats. Now, if we were to assume that the salinity of the ice was the same as water, which is not, and thus the density of the melted ice would be the same as the density of water, what would happen to the ocean levels, right, density of melted ice, same as density of the seawater? If that was true, what would happen to ocean levels if all of those Arctic icebergs melted? We do what? Because they're floating, they're displacing a volume equal to their weight, or a volume with a weight equal to the weight of the icebergs. So if the density of melted iceberg was the same as the density of seawater, it would make no difference to the sea levels whatsoever. For the Arctic, what about the Antarctic? Antarctic, Antarctica is a continent. So you have now ice that's on top of ground. What happens when it melts? It's going to flow into the ocean and increase the water level. So when you're talking about warming causing a change in the ocean levels, Arctic warming isn't going to change the ocean levels. Doesn't mean it's not important, but it's not going to change the ocean levels. Antarctic warming, yeah, that's going to change the ocean levels significantly. Um, I think currently there, well, there are people who argue both ways. The the extent of the ice in the Antarctic is actually larger than it has been in the past, which should predict the lowering of the ocean levels. Um, but there's the extent, how much area it covers, as well as the depth to be considered. Okay, now flowing fluids. Fluids are called fluids because they can flow, right? It's a pretty simple definition there. Types of flow, we had two types of flow, laminar flow, flowing in layers. Or turbulent flow, which is when you have it, you know, doing things that are, well, turbulent. What makes the difference in those? It comes down to that Reynolds number. We didn't have Reynolds number on exam three, but that didn't stop people from trying to use the Reynolds number on the problem involving the Bernoulli equation. So the Reynolds number is a number that you calculate that is going to tell you if it's laminar or if it is turbulent. And we had two different equations for the Reynolds number, one for an object with fluid flowing past it, and one for fluid flowing through a pipe. 
So, you know, you, you have two equations for that. And low Reynolds numbers is going to be more laminar flow, high Reynolds numbers, more turbulent flow, depends on situation, how that works out. The continuity equation, you definitely had to use Q is equal to speed of flow times the area or the volume of flow per unit time. So if I have an enclosed fluid and I don't have turbulence, then my flow rate is going to remain constant. If I have turbulence, I actually can have, you know, there were no bubbles, now there are bubbles, and I could have a change in flow rate somewhat. But if it's laminar, that's always going to be true. The Bernoulli equation was the equation based on the work energy principle that told us how elevation and speed affect pressure. And so that one gave us the equation that pressure plus one half density V squared plus density GH equals constant. Putting those two ideas together, we could solve the problem with the uh, roof of the house. Now, there was a wording issue with that problem. It should have said, what's the net force caused by air pressure? When I was editing the questions, I didn't notice that it didn't have that state statement. And so, you know, there, there could be different answers. I had to be a little more generous on the grading there because you could have said, well, you know, assuming that the roof stays on the house, then the acceleration is zero or, you know, something like that. And of course, you'd have to know the mass of the roof if you're going to calculate what the force of gravity is, and you didn't have that. So not having the mass was supposed to be your key to know that it was just the net force caused by air, but it should have been worded better. I apologize. So for that problem, you had the roof of the house, you had air blowing over the top with a speed V, and you had still air inside. And so you're going to have a force on the top equal to the pressure on top times the area and a force from the bottom equal to the pressure from the bottom times the area. And so to find the net force due to air, that's as far as you can go with using Newton's second law. Now I need to find something about the pressure difference, and that's where I use the Bernoulli relation. So the Bernoulli relation says that force top plus one-half density of my fluid, which is air, times V top squared plus density of my fluid, G height of the top. <laughs> that's a pressure, funny P. So that's writing out the full-on Bernoulli equation. I was looking for pressure bottom minus pressure top. Put in your zeros. What are my zeros? Well, the speed of the air in the house is zero. And the height of the bottom of the roof, the height of the top of the roof, as far as we know, is zero. It didn't give us any information about the thickness of the roof, so we just assume it's negligibly small. And so I'm just going to set my reference point so height top is equal to height bottom is zero. And I'm left with PB minus PT equals one half density of air VT squared. And so put that into my net force equation. And that was the equation to find the net force on the roof due to the air. Is that net force going to be upward or downward? Upward, because when you have the moving air, that higher speed air means that it has a lower pressure, hence it's pushing down on the top less. And so the roof can be popped up if you have too fast a wind, which is pretty bizarre. Poiseuille's law. You actually had a problem with Poiseuille's law. The one with the tank it filled with oil with a tube. Now, for Southwestern people, everybody at Southwestern got a point for the correct answer because it wasn't possible to get the correct answer. And so whether you got it or not, I gave you the credit for that because it wasn't possible. Because you had to know 
you have a height H. So the pressure, the thing, remember the question said to focus on this tube. The flow through the tube depends on pressure one, the length, pressure two, that was supposed to be a one there, and the area out here, so I'll put the radius. Those were the three things that were important, the length of the tube, the radius of the tube, and the pressure difference. And so you used pressure difference was rho GH, right? For people Southwestern, you didn't have that H, so at that point you would have been, uh-oh, I don't have a variable I need. And then the Q is equal to delta V over delta T. It gave you delta V and it gave you delta T, so you just put those numbers in, is equal to pi R to the fourth delta P over eight times the viscosity times the length. And you solve that for viscosity. So that was an example of using Poiseuille's law. What's viscosity? A lot of people said this correctly. What is viscosity? Okay, it's, it's something that tells us about the force between molecules, how easily they flow past each other. Low viscosity, low force between the molecules, they flow very easily. High viscosity, high force between them, they don't flow very well. Okay. Chapter 13 and 14 and 15 were our thermodynamics chapters. So we had our four laws of thermodynamics. Zeroth law, temperature A equals temperature B, and temperature B equals temperature C, then temperature A equals temperature C. First law, energy can't be created or destroyed, which we write in equation form as change in internal energy is equal to the heat added minus the work done by the system. You don't have the words added and done on your equation sheet. You need to know that the, the oh man, English language is failing me again. The convention that we use in our textbook is that work is the work done by the system. And so this is saying the change in internal energy is how much heat you add minus how much work you send out. Second law couple different ways. One way is that heat naturally flows from hotter to colder. Another one is that entropy will never decrease in a process. You may have a piece of the process has a decrease, but another piece has to have an increase so that the total is a net increase. Entropy, you know, make sure you have those ideas in your head. Um, then we finally have the third law of thermodynamics, which simply says, nothing can reach absolute zero. Absolute zero is a limit that nothing can reach, but they can approach. Make sure you are able to use the three basic temperature scales, Fahrenheit, Celsius, and Kelvin. And, you know, we had a problem on the test about thermal expansion, you know, the gasoline. It would be cheaper to buy gasoline if it's dispensed per volume when it's cold because you're going to get more molecules per gallon when it's cold because of thermal expansion. Um, ideal gases, you should know what makes an ideal gas, you know, what are the ideal properties. And the ideal gas law, obviously the ideal gas law played in most of the problems on the last exam. And then the kinetic theory of gases, some people had to calculate the RMS speed, some people had to calculate the average speed. But you have the uh, kinetic theory there talking about how temperatures telling us about speed of molecules um, humidity and evaporation of boiling, we did very little on those, so don't worry about those. I've got 30 seconds according to the wall. Mechanisms of heat, we had a problem that was a conduction problem. That pot sitting on a surface, you're going to have the heat dissipated the quickest if you have power is equal to Q over delta T, K times area over length, multiplied by the temperature difference. So if you have a large area of contact, so a smooth surface is going to be better for conduction. And if you have a high thermal conductivity in the material, metals have high conductivities, whether it's electrical or thermal. And so you'd want the metal with the smooth surface there. Um, make sure you can do calorimetry. We are out of time. 
after thermodynamics, of course, we have our sound that we just finished. I'm not so worried about getting through that simply because we've just finished.